remember when I was the new kid on the block coming into Collar Lab. Now I are history. <laughs> and I'm sitting here looking at my son, Vernon, who's a new kid on the block. In 30 years, dude, you're going to be history too. <laughs> be prepared. I would like to uh, digress just a moment, or regress perhaps, with what uh, some of the things that Jim has said, and go back to the point that actually the first thinking of Colorado began in 1960 in Colorado Springs, Colorado, with a meeting of Bob Osgood, Ed Gilmore, and Frank Lane. And that's when they first started talking about of the possibility that could it or could it not be done. It took 15 years to finally put it together, as Jim told you how that took place. And I knew all of this was going on. I was not invited to the first group but I knew it was taking place because I had somebody on the inside <laughs> filling me in on what was taking place and I was just about to die to get in it, you know. But I knew I had to wait my turn and be invited in in our early days to get to go to a Caller Lab convention you had to be invited by at least two people. And I was fortunate enough to be invited to the first convention in 1974 and have been involved ever since. And that invitation situation continued for several years thereafter. And of course we now don't have that. You don't have to be invited. We invite any and everybody to become a member of our organization. Bob Osgood served as executive secretary for two years and then Stan Burdick served as executive secretary for one year. And in 1976, Jim Mayo was elected the first chairman of the board. And also in that same year, the Board of Governors hired John Carlton Toller as executive secretary. It's very difficult for me to believe that we made two mistakes in the same year. <laughs> committee, and there were 15 of us on that committee to begin with. I was on that committee. 
we had four ballots among the committee before we ever came up with a list that we thought we could live with. Then from that uh, a basic list of 68, which we started with, out of the numbers of people on the committee, the recommended teach time for those 68 basics ranged anywhere from 10 weeks to 80. <laughs> we finally settled on 40 weeks of two hours each, and that was in 1976 when we adopted the mainstream basic list on a one-year trial basis. Then in 1977, it was adopted on a permanent basis. In charge of accreditation of callers, and that was to accredit, give callers a title. We had nothing. And I recall I was teaching square dancing at the University of Texas at Arlington in a PE course. And, and in their interview of me, they said, don't you have any type of qualification? And I said, no but we're working on it <laughs> because I knew the caller and I was thinking about it. But, and, and their comment back to me was, well, e even the, those who teach diving have a certificate. <laughs> those who teach Red Cross have a certificate, but callers didn't have one. So we were encouraging caller and I to hurry up and get us a title. So, and it was really neat that there at the University of Texas at Arlington, as soon as I got a certificate of accreditation, they accepted me as a teacher in their school, uh, even though I didn't have any paper credentials to qualify myself. And also, with regard to accreditation of caller coaches, Bill Peters was in charge of that, and we pushed the heck out of it and trying to get it done. And the Board of Governors could not decide how to come up with a, the initial program to begin with. And so after a lengthy discussion, it was finally decided that three people on the East Coast would be chosen, three people in the Central United States, and three on the West Coast would be chosen to get themselves accredited as caller coaches in the initial program to begin with. On the East Coast was Jim Mayo, Al Brundage and Jack Lazary. And on the West Coast was Bill Peters, Bob Van Antwerp, and Lee Helsel. In the Central United States was Frank Lane, Cal Golden, and me. And I tell the story that it wasn't easy. In the first examination that we took, there were over 300 questions on the first examination that each of us had to pass. And then after that, we did the oral examination of each other. And I've told the story that Frank Lane and Cal Golden and I spent three days in a motel in Mobile, Alabama, examining each other. <laughs> <coughs> and that's fact. <laughs> so anyway, those were the nine original accredited color coaches in Colorado. And uh, some of us are still active. The writing of the definitions of these 68 calls that we had selected was a tremendous task. Not only did we already have some, but we felt they needed to be revised. And so Ken Kernan was put in, was chairman of that committee. It took three years and 17 ballots to finally get them accepted on a one year trial basis. Then after a one-year trial basis, they were accepted on a permanent basis without any further change. Timing of these basics was a tremendous task. Dick Ledger was placed in charge as chairman of that committee. And lots of dancing, lots of demonstration, <coughs> lots of everything involved with every single call on the list until a timing was established for each and every one of them. The styling of these basics was also a big question. <coughs> Melton Luttrell was put in charge and chairman of that committee. And Melton's sitting back there in the back. A lot more dancing, a lot more exercises, a lot more sessions. And it was finally presented and the styling was approved. Herb Eggender, became the first 
the assistant executive secretary of Colorado. I don't recall what year. Do you recall her? Sometime between 1974 and now. <laughs> I don't recall exactly when. Her was on the board of governors, and when we finally decided that we needed an assistant executive secretary, well, then Herb applied for the job, and he got it. And so it was, uh, I remember him saying it was very difficult for him to give up his seat on the board to become assistant executive secretary. But he did and did an excellent job with that. That title was later changed to executive director. And so that is the title that it is today. John Tauntenthaler was the ex executive director for 15 years. And I remember one situation, uh, Jim Mayo was the first chairman of the board, Jack Baffrey was the second chairman, and I was the third. And while I was chairman of the board, John K. sent out all the information from the office and it had his signature on it. And in many cases it was for the Board of Governors or for the Executive Committee or whatever, but anyhow it had his name on it. And I told everybody, I said, we may as well get used to it. John Caldenthaler is going to be known as Mr. Carlap. And that just happens with the job that comes with the title. And so one particular individual, after a letter that John K. had sent out, wrote back in and he said, well, here comes another oracle from the pinnacle. <laughs> <laughs> and so in, 1960, in 1976 in Chicago at that time when Jim was elected chairman of the board, I gave him the title of Chairman Michael. <laughs> and John K. became John Carlton or whatever the heck your name is. <laughs> Nobody could pronounce it anyway. But Bill, Jim mentioned Bill Burleson earlier. It was in 1970 that he began the uh, encyclopedia. I did some investigating about this and found out that he had footwork with him in the very beginning and during the years that he published this. And from 1970 until about 1985 was the Bill Burleson Encyclopedia of Squarnay's Columns. And I think that thing is up around 7,000 now, something like that. Does anybody know for sure? I, I have a copy of it at home, Bill Boyd. Uh, with uh, American Square Dance Magazine now has that book. Is Bill in here? I don't see him. Okay. Uh, Bill Burleson was never a, a caller. He was just a dancer, but he was enthused about the activity, and so he started that book. But that's just some of the things that have happened in the organization since we began. I'd like to regress just a moment. You mentioned Les Gocher earlier. Uh, well, uh, Les was a hero of mine. In fact, I copied his style of calling. I could call just like him and sound just like him, and still can today. <laughs> and uh, until my good friend C.O. Guest told me, he said, John, if you would call like yourself instead of Les Gocher, you'd be a whole lot better caller. <laughs> And so it opened my eyes about that, but Les and I were good friends, and he's written several books, and he published his own magazine for a long time in his own note, note service, and was very involved. It, the last two books he published, one of them was Dancing Among the Stars, and, and he talks about all kinds of things in there, uh, and the movies that he was in. At, at one time in his early days, for a short period of time, he was a double for Clark Gable, and a lot of people don't know that. But I remember Les telling me in his early traveling days, and, and Jim mentioned that the calls were named, and every call had a name and a series of names, and the dancers memorized them by names. And we had the, 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 uh, such things as The Route, and Take a Little Peek, and, and Three Little Sisters, and, and Dip and Dive. And Les said in his travels that there would be some halls that he would go into that they would have a bulletin board up on the wall with the names of the calls and the dances and the order that they were to be done in. The calls, the, yeah, the whole thing was up there. And, and he said at one time he switched and, and did one in a different number and said, boy, they didn't pay him. <laughs> if you screwed up, dude, well, you ain't gonna get paid. You, know, you changed the order. We were expecting to name songs. I had this lady to dance with on that dance and you changed it. You know. So that's the kind of thing that they ran into in the earlier days of traveling. And, and at one time, there were a number of traveling callers that made their living as a full-time traveling caller. They ain't but a couple doing that today. And they've got something else to fall back on because the money ain't there uh, anymore. But that brings us kind of up to date, and most of you know about where we stand with our activity from that point on up to here. But, uh, we have traced square dancing back to at least 1400 
in, in the early days. In spite of what people say, I wasn't around. Herb said he wasn't there at that time, but <laughs> he'd been around a long time. There is a group still dancing, a similar type dancing to what Herb was talking about that Pappy Shaw did called the Rocky Mountain Dancers up in Denver, Colorado, and they will probably be dancing at the National Convention. They meant they were in Oklahoma City last, no, yeah, last year. And uh, Cal Golden is also involved with some of those people. So if you ever get the chance to see them dance, it's really neat. And I've watched them, and some of them have danced in the stable up at uh, uh, Central City that Herb was talking about. And a good friend of ours, uh, Larry Wiley, went up there and was resident caller there in Central City for a number of years. And uh, Al Tex Brownlee was one of the first callers there. Ray Smith was one of the first callers uh, in there after Pappy Shaw. And I can recall something in history if I did. We're going to offer a, a couple of things that were really interesting. And uh, Ray Smith went to Pappy Shaw's school uh, uh, at least twice that I know of. And I have an old picture at home that has a bunch of them in it with Al Brundage. And, uh, he learned all around the left hand lady and seesaw your partner. And he brought it back to teach it to Texas. And he taught it wrong. <laughs> we did all around the left hand lady by going in front of the corner. And then we came back and we went around in front of our partner. And that's the way we learned it. And when we went out to dance in another town, <laughs> away from the Dallas Fort Worth area, we had head on collisions like we would. <laughs> And we younger dancers wouldn't give in to the older ones <laughs> do it our way. So anyway, uh, Ray and his brother Harper got us all together and said, hey, we're doing this wrong. We need to change it. Would you believe that we had some dancers quit dancing because we changed it? We in fact did. And then there was another situation, the whole rest of the United States was doing a call called do -si do which was a four people thing, two couples. In Texas, we did it with everybody. do -si do was your partner left and your corner right and keep on doing it until the caller got tired. You'd do it as many times as he told you to. Well, Herb Gregerson from El Paso was the one that invented the do -si do in Texas. And so Pappy Shaw was pretty smart. He went to Herb and got them together and said, hey, look, we might ought to try to change this thing. Herb Gregerson said, no way. <laughs> Texas ain't changing for nobody. <laughs> well, Pappy Shaw said, wait a minute, Herb. Let's take the call and make it like you're doing it from a circle, but let's turn partner left and corner right and come back and turn partner left like a courtesy turn, and let's name it Herb Gregerson was from El Paso. And Pappy says, let's name it Do Paso. Herb bought it. <laughs> he liked the idea. Then we found out that, and Al Brundage says, wait a minute. On the East Coast, we do it this other way. Jim, add to that. At the 1949 meeting at uh, Pappy's Color School, Herb and Al were in this discussion, well, Pappy was trying to do it. The other issue Pappy was solving was whether or not to take hands on a right and left through. In New England, it was a no-hand action. We passed through and we then turned as a couple, but without contact, without an arm around courtesy turn. And Pappy wanted to standardize that as a take hands and, and courtesy turn action. And Al and her traded off because Pappy was going to take a vote. And, and so Al said he would vote for the Do Paso if Herb would vote for the No Hands. Al lost. Herb won. 